So my name is Michael Gorn, and today I'll be speaking about freehand transparental prostate biopsy performed under local anesthesia. Uh, first, some disclosures, being this is a CME uh, event. Uh, I am currently a paid consultant for BK Medical. Coelis and Corbin Clinical Resources, also known as Perineal Logic, is the maker of the Precision Point Transperineal Access System. So why are we talking about transperineal prostate biopsy? Well, the reason why is because transrectal prostate biopsy, which is currently the most commonly performed method for performing prostate biopsy, is associated with a number of significant complications. In this review article from the uh, American Neurological Association on complications of prostate biopsy, they reported an infectious complication rate of approximately 5 to 7% with the transrectal approach. Nearly half of these patients will be hospitalized as a result of their infection uh, with sepsis and will require IV antibiotics. A subset of these patients even will uh, succumb to their infection and die as a result of undergoing this procedure. As a result, the American Neurological Association makes a series of recommendations regarding the avoidance of infectious complications associated with performing prostate biopsy. Two of these approaches <clears throat> uh, allow the user to continue performing transrectal prostate biopsy, but advocate for doing so um, with uh, the use of antibiotics. The first approach, uh, patients undergo a rectal culture and then targeted prophylaxis to the microbes within the patient's rectum uh, are administered. In the second approach that's, um, uh, that is supported by the American Neurological Association, patients undergo administration of augmented antibiotics. Uh, here, they recommend uh, either giving a fluoroquinolone plus a cephalosporin or something like an aminoglycoside like gentamicin or even an antibiotic like uh, amikacin or, uh, or meropenem. The trouble with these two approaches is that they violate the principles of antibiotic stewardship. As, uh, as we are well aware, over the last uh, several decades, there's been a market increase in the, in the, um, in the prevalence of antibiotic resistant uh, strains of bacteria. These data show from 2003 to 2012, significant increases in the number of urinary isolates of, of bacteria which are uh, resistant to nitrofurantoin, ciprofloxacin, and batrum. So by continuing to give patients antibiotics, we are contributing to this problem. As an alternative approach, the American Neurological Association also advocates for consideration of the transperineal approach to performing prostate biopsy. The reason for this is unlike the transrectal approach where biopsy needles pass through the rectal mucosa on the trajectory to the prostate and so could pick up fecal contamination, with the transperineal approach, the biopsy needles go through uh, skin, they take a percutaneous route, thereby avoiding the, the rectal mucosa altogether, and so uh, the, the risk of infection, in theory, should go down uh, with this approach. Uh, and also, uh, one could even argue that antibiotics aren't required at all when performing the, the transperineal approach. So um, while you know, it, is, um, it is certainly reason, reasonable to, uh, to suspect that taking the transperineal approach is associated with a lower risk of, in, of infections, what is known in the literature? Well, in this uh, review article performed by Grumman and coworkers, it's published in the DJUI in 2014, uh, these authors went through all the different series in the literature available on transperineal prostate biopsy and looked to establish what the infectious complication rate is. Uh, we know from the American Neurological Association paper that the risk with a transrectal biopsy is roughly, again, 5 to 7 percent. Here in this study, which include data from 6,609 patients, the authors found an infectious complication uh, uh, rate of less than 0 0.1 percent, uh, actually 0 0.076 percent. So a, a markedly decreased risk of infectious complications associated with the transperineal approach. Of note, um, almost all the patients included across these series still uh, did, however, receive antibiotics. Um, when comparing directly the transperineal approach to the transrectal approach, uh, as was done in this meta-analysis of, of, of case control studies uh, published in the World Journal of Surgical Oncology, these authors found a near five-fold reduction in the risk of infectious complications with the transperineal approach, again, versus the transrectal approach. Um, again, in many of these studies, just like in the Grumman paper, the patients still received uh, antibiotic prophylaxis. Looking at these data in our practice, mine and my partners, Dr. Matt Alloway here at Urology Association Cumberland, Maryland, we took the approach starting in 2015 
to perform transperineal prostate biopsy without administration of anti any antibiotics. During this period of time, we performed roughly 450 uh, prostate biopsies. Um, these patients, again, underwent a transperineal prostate biopsy without prophylactic antibiotics, and all patients underwent an RN or MD follow-up within a week of, of the prostate biopsy. Uh, in our experience, no patient experienced a septic episode, and only one patient experienced a urinary tract infection uh, managed with outpatient antibiotics for a total rate of 0.2%. And while the world's literature mostly includes series where transperineal prostate biopsy was performed with antibiotics, there are now uh, other series, just like ours here, showing that this technique could be performed without administration of antibiotics whatsoever, and the risk of infectious complications remains quite low, under 1%. So in addition to offering imperi, uh, Im improved, um, uh, an improved risk profile with respect to infectious complications, the transperineal approach for prostate biopsy also offers the advantage of superior sampling of the anterior aspect of the prostate. And this is simply because the needles are traversing the prostate from the apex to the base rather than from the posterior to anterior aspect as in the transrectal prostate biopsy. So what is known about the location of prostate cancer and whether or not this translates to actually improve cancer detection rates? Well, in this study, which was published in the European uh, Urology in 2017, the authors looked at what was the locations of cancer found um, in, in, in prostate samples. And what they found is roughly 40% of all prostate cancers are found in the anterior aspect of the gland. When one looks at just, the, just those cases which are missed by transrectal uh, ultrasound-guided prostate biopsy, they found that despite only uh, representing 40% of cancers, uh, up to 80% of all missed cancers are actually found in the anterior aspect of the gland. In this study here, um, the authors performed a randomized controlled trial where patients served as their own internal control, um, where uh, patients underwent uh, both a transrectal and a transperineal prostate biopsy um, with MRI guidance. Consistent with the data that I showed previously, where a good proportion of uh, prostate cancers are found in the anterior gland, and even more of those are uh, missed with the transrectal approach, these authors found that roughly twice as many prostate cancers can be found, or significant prostate cancers can be found, when transperineal fusion is performed as opposed to transrectal fusion. Um, this translates to a roughly 25%, um, I'm sorry, a 15% increase in the total overall cancer detection rate. Um, uh, but the results are even more dramatic when looking at simply uh, clinically significant cancers. In addition to that, uh, research from my group when I was previously at Johns Hopkins, we looked at whether or not transperineal prostate biopsy improved uh, the, uh, the upgrading uh, of men with, uh, on active surveillance for low risk prostate cancer. Um, we, uh, we looked at patients who underwent the transperineal approach uh, once enrolled in, in active surveillance versus those who underwent the transrectal approach uh, historic controls. And what we found is a near 50% increase in the risk of uh, of, of cancer upgrading once men underwent the transperineal approach for prostate biopsy. Consistent with that trial that I had showed you earlier where patients served as their own controls undergoing both a transrectal and a transperineal prostate biopsy, we found that uh, among patients who underwent an image-guided biopsy in this cohort, that there was a significant improvement in the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer in, in patients who have both a PIRADS-3 or a PIRADS-4 lesion suggesting that the transperineal approach allows for a greater ease of access uh, to targeted lesions. Py uh, PIRADS-5 lesions were detected with similar frequency between the two groups, and that's probably because these lesions simply are just so large that there's really no, uh, no risk of missing them with either approach. However, these more, uh, in, uh, these more inconspicuous lesions, PIRADS-3 and PIRADS-4 lesions, there was uh, a significant increase uh, when performing the transperineal approach. So what are the methods for performing transperineal prostate biopsy? Well, the most commonly performed method for transperineal prostate biopsy calls for use of what's known as a grid stepper unit. Many of you are probably familiar with this if you perform brachytherapy, cryoablation, or even now space or. Um, essentially, it's a mechanical unit uh, to which the uh, ultrasound probe is mounted. The probe then goes in uh, the rectum, 
Um, and then on top of the stepper device, a grid, a grid plate is placed. The grid plate is then pressed up against the perineum and through these grid holes under ultrasound guidance, the biopsy needles traverse the perineal skin and allow for biopsy of the prostate gland. The trouble with this approach, however, is uh, that because we use a, because a, uh, a grid plate is used, a large area of perineal skin must be anesthetized in order for patients uh, to, uh, to tolerate this procedure, which is very difficult to perform. And so the vast majority of these procedures have been performed under either spinal or general anesthesia. And this has been a major barrier to the uptake of the transperineal approach, at least historically. Just to show this uh, diagrammatically, here's an image of a man's perineum. Uh, and then overlying it is the grid plate. And you can see that roughly an area of eight centimeters by eight centimeters would need to be anesthetized in order for the patient to tolerate passage of the needles through these many grid holes. This challenge could be overcome with the use of two common access points to the perineum. Um, and here I show those two uh, potential access points here just north of the, uh, of the rectum. And so you could imagine that if you could figure out a way to perform uh, prostate biopsy, where the needles only go through these small areas of skin, then this could be performed much more tolerably uh, under local anesthesia. And as I'll show you in just a moment, that's exactly what folks have done in order to translate the transperineal procedure from the operating room setting into the clinic setting where it can now be performed with local anesthesia. Um, I'm sorry, I went the wrong direction. Um, another challenge with performing the grid-based approach is the fact that the bony pelvis interferes with the passage of needles through the grid. So here I've overlaid on the image that I shown earlier, the prostate, as well as the bony pelvis. If you superimpose upon that uh, the, uh, the grid, you can see that many of the needle holes um, will, um, are in the, the path of the, um, of, the, of the pubic bones. And so because you have to adhere to this straight on trajectory with the biopsy needles, um, it becomes at times difficult to sample all aspects of the prostate using the grid-based approach. Um, and so again, this could be overcome by using common access points um, uh, below the level of the pubic bone, where then could, one could then, using a freehand-based approach, navigate the needles under this bony anatomy. So this is exactly what has been done, and this is what's known as the freehand approach to performing transperineal prostate biopsy. Uh, you can see here, in contrast to the grid-based approach, the user holds the ultrasound probe in their hand, so it's not mounted to a grid stepper, and there no longer is a grid plate on the perineum. In contrast, a common access cannula has been placed on, on one side of the, the raffe, and then again on the other, to sample the other side. And in doing this, only a small area of skin needs to be anesthetized in order for the, the provider to perform this procedure. Additionally, because you're not bound by the limitations of the grid, the user is able to take needle trajectories on oblique angles, thereby avoiding the, uh, the bony pelvis. A challenge with this approach, however, is that the access cannula is not tethered to the ultrasound probe. So the user must rotate the ultrasound probe rather continuously throughout this procedure in order to maintain visualization of the biopsy needle as it goes through that common access cannula. This limitation was recently overcome with the introduction of the precision point transperineal access system from Perineal Logic. The precision point transperineal access system is a, is a disposable device that's comprised of three components. Here we show those three components. There's a rail clamp grid, no, I'm sorry, there's a rail clamp uh, subassembly, um, a needle guide with five aperture holes, and that common access cannula uh, that, uh, that goes through the grid holes, uh, which then slides along the, um, the uh, ra uh, rail clamp subassembly. Here, here you can see the device assembled on the ultrasound probe. What that does is it tethers the access needle to the ultrasound probe ensuring perfect alignment of the access needle with the uh, arrays of the ultrasound probe, ensuring that the biopsy needle is visible throughout the procedure. Um, here are some images from a paper that my group published in urology demonstrating use of the precision point device. Here you can see that the, uh, the precision point device is attached to the ultrasound probe. With that, we simply numb the uh, areas of skin where the common access cannula will go. So again, two very small areas in the perineum for the passage of needles. Um, using the device, we then inject the local anesthesia deeper to the pelvic floor uh, muscles and the prostate itself. And then once everything has been numbed up, the access cannula is engaged into the small area of skin. 
The biopsy needle then passes through this common access cannula, where then using the principles of the freehand based approach, the, uh, the biopsy needle could be guided to virtually any area in the prostate um, at a multitude of different angles, thereby avoiding the Bode anatomy and allowing for really spectacular sampling of the prostate. Here you can see the typical biplanar ultrasound display that one sees when performing one of these biopsies using the precision point device. And you can see here the needle both in the sagittal and the axial plane, um, allowing for uh, uh, sampling of the prostate. So again, this freehand-based approach could be performed under local anesthesia, but what is the optimal block for performing freehand transperineal uh, prostate biopsy? So just a quick, for a quick review um, of the anatomy of the prostate and the relevant neural anatomy. Um, when one performs a transperineal prostate biopsy, what we're really concerned with is being able to adequately numb the skin and then the muscles deep to the skin and subcutaneous tissue, as the muscles are really the point where the patient feels the most pain when the biopsy needles pass on the trajectory to the prostate. So the pelvic floor in the area where the biopsy needles will pass is innervated by branches of the pudendal nerve. The pudendal nerve arises uh, just beneath the ischial tuberosity um, and then fans out with branches all throughout uh, the levator anine muscles and other muscles of the pelvic floor. So one of the blocks that can be performed to, uh, to allow for the successful performance of transperineal prostate biopsy under local anesthesia is what's known as the periapical triangle block. Uh, in the periapical triangle block, the needle is passed uh, through that common access cannula, and then essentially the user injects lidocaine so that they numb up the entire area extending from the levator ani muscle to the midline of the prostate uh, in this triangle-like configuration uh, like so, and this is done bilaterally. To help numb the prostate itself, some have described performing what's known as a periprostatic block. So just as performed when one does a transrectal prostate biopsy, and the goal is to place lidocaine underneath the seminal vesicle, so that way the uh, neurovascular bundles of the prostate are bathed with lidocaine, the same could be performed uh, with the transperineal approach. Uh, simply the biopsy, uh, sorry, the, uh, the injection needle is directed laterally towards the neurovascular bundles and the lidocaine is injected beneath the prostate. Probably an easier way of performing this, however, is what's known as a prostate apex block. So rather than having to be so lateral on the prostate, if you simply stay more medial and poke the needle uh, beyond the endopelvic fascia to the space between the prostate and the endopelvic fascia, you could inject lidocaine so that it fills that space. And then because it's a closed, uh, closed space, this lidocaine will then find its way to track along to the neurovascular bundles, uh, numbing the prostate. Um, one final block that can be performed is what's known as the pudendal nerve block, where uh, the urologist attempts to get the pudendal nerve at its trunk at the at Alcox Canal just below the ischial tuberosity. The challenge with this approach, however, is that there are vessels that run along with the um, pudendal nerve, including the pudendal artery and vein. And so there's a risk of um, injecting local anesthesia into these large vessels. And in addition to that, it's very difficult to see the nerve on ultrasound guidance. And so it becomes somewhat of a challenge to perform uh, a pudendal nerve block. And the uh, success rate of this block uh, is really only in the range of 50 to 70%. So uh, the user really must block these peripheral nerves as well when performing this procedure. So what are the outcomes with these block techniques? Well, this is uh, a review article, again, published in British Journal of Urology, where uh, many of the papers on transperineal prostate biopsy have been published over the years. Uh, and, the, uh, and the authors here summarize uh, the, the outcomes with these blocks, including uh, the uh, periprostatic nerve block, the pudenda block, the periapical triangle block, and the prostatic apex block. Suffice it to say that uh, all of these blocks achieve uh, adequate pain control, uh, both at the time of local anesthesia administration, as well as during prostate, the prostate biopsy itself, with the median pain scores or the mean pain scores, rather, all being in the range of two to three. Uh, for patients, so completely acceptable, uh, allowing for this procedure to be performed in the outpatient setting. So there's always a lot of questions surrounding what is the optimal template for performing a freehand transparent prostate biopsy. So I'll just quickly cover this. Um, so uh, in order to understand the, uh, the, the best template to perform, it's important to review the zonal anatomy of the prostate. As probably most on the, uh, on the uh, listening to the talk are aware, are aware, the prostate is broken up into um, four discrete zones, including the peripheral zone, the central zone, the transition zone, and the anterior fibromuscular stroma. Well, when folks have done whole mount studies and have mapped the topography 
of prostate cancer throughout the zones of the prostate, what you see is a distribution of the pro of prostate cancer around the peripheral zone of the gland. There is some extension of prostate cancer into the anterior fibromuscular stroma, but most of what the prostate cancer that we see is really contained in the uh, peripheral zone of the prostate. Um, these data um, have been replicated in several uh, similar studies looking at whole mount biopsy specimens. Uh, this one here shows roughly the same as in the prior, uh, prior diagrams I've shown. So in thinking about performing a transperineal prostate biopsy, uh, we advocate for performing one that encompasses basically the ring of tissue around the periphery of the prostate. Uh, our group has developed what's known as the 10 sector biopsy template, uh, where the biopsy is, uh, we're sorry, where the prostate is broken up into five sectors on either side. And then two cores are taken in each one of those sectors for a total of a 24 prostate biopsy. Here you can see we're, we're biopsying the peripheral zone posterior medial aspect of the prostate, peripheral zone posterior lateral aspect of the prostate, peripheral zone anterior aspect of the prostate, as well as the anterior fibromuscular stroma. In large prostates, uh, there is always the challenge of reaching the base of the prostate when you approach it from the apex to base direction. And so uh, when prostates are large, we additionally biopsy out laterally at the base of the gland uh, to complete the 10 sector technique. These are data published uh, by Ben Rousseau and my partner, Dr. Matt Alloway in Neurologic Oncology, looking at the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer and all grade prostate cancer using this 10 sector based approach. And what they found is that prostate cancer could be found in each and every one of those sectors at fairly significant frequency uh, when applying this technique. Uh, so based on these data, we really feel it's necessary to biopsy the entire rim of the peripheral zone of the prostate uh, using uh, a 10 sector approach or uh, perhaps an eight sector approach if the prostate is quite short, uh, then you really don't have to worry about the base of the prostate, uh, but definitely want to sample the peripheral aspect of the prostate in the manner in which I've shown. So what about MRI targeting using the transperineal approach? This could absolutely be performed uh, under local anesthesia using the precision point device or even the freehand based approach. Here are some uh, data from uh, my experience when I was formerly at Johns Hopkins using the precision point device performing cognitive fusion transperineal prostate biopsy, again, under local anesthesia. Um, here you could see that um, we were uh, able to detect clinically, uh, clinically significant prostate cancer in 76% of cases with pyrides 5 lesions, 38.2% pyrides 4 lesions, and 18.2% in, uh, in pyrides 3 lesions. Uh, in addition to that, we, do, we were able to find clinically insignificant cancer. And when you sum these two bars up, you get roughly the same rates of prostate cancer detection that you see with a formal software-based system. Um, cognitive fusion isn't the only way for performing MRI uh, targeted prostate biopsy with transperineal approach. Uh, now a number of different manufacturers uh, produce systems uh, for this purpose, uh, including Uranav, BK Fusion, and Coelis. All of these uh, manufacturers offer a freehand-based approach, which could readily be performed uh, using, um, using local anesthesia. So conclusions. So transrectal prostate biopsy is a tried and true method for diagnosing prostate cancer. However, this approach is associated with significant risk of infectious complications. As I outlined earlier, the risk is roughly five to 7%. Transperineal prostate biopsy reduces the risk of infection by avoiding the rectum. Additionally, it offers the benefit, uh, uh, it offers the benefit of greatly reducing uh, rectal bleeding. This is a complication actually, which I didn't touch upon this technique, but uh, I'm sorry, didn't touch upon in this talk, but uh, suffice it to say that because the biopsy needles do not traverse the rectal mucosa, there is no risk of hematochesia uh, with performing transperineal prostate biopsy. Methods now exist to safely and comfortably perform transperineal prostate biopsy under local anesthesia in the outpatient setting without antibiotics. Uh, as I have shown that when, one, that when one uses antibiotics, the transperineal approach is associated with a near zero risk of infectious complications. However, even when we omit antibiotics, we could get that rate down to less than uh, 1% and uh, maintain the principles of uh, good antibiotic stewardship. Studies have shown excellent cancer detection rates with the transperineal approach, uh, possibly superior to transrectal prostate biopsy. Uh, so with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you to the audience as well as to the meeting organizers. Thank you.